Hey guys, it's CL, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I make brand new Critical Role recaps every Monday at noon. I would be happy to have you join the party. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe and hit the Bertrand bell to be notified of future videos. Now, without further ado, let's discuss the second episode of Candela Obscura. First, I just want to apologize for the voice. I just got back from a Taylor Swift concert and you bet I screamed my ass off. Anyway, our story resumes at the Getaway Grand Hotel, a place known for its trysts, located in the Red Lamp District of the city. A woman wearing an emerald necklace is about to make love to a handsome, square-jawed man. But before we fade to black, the roarous noise of delight and merriment from the surrounding area is cut by two screams. We return to Augie, who has settled in at the Gilded Rainbow and is my fave because he tries to bum a smoke from Alexander the Lightkeeper, which she refuses. But the circle reunites as the Lightkeeper has summoned them for a new mystery. Onette Ferris, a chamberwoman steeped in imports and tariffs within the city and is currently making a bottleneck with open trade from outside the city, is the woman from our prologue and has gone missing. All we know is a large shadowed beast has been seen fleeing the area. Arlo is direct and asks, do you have something that can kill large shadow beasts? Which I loved. And Alexandra the Lightkeeper gifts them with a small corked vial of a molasses-like liquid within it. The group then head to the Getaway Grand Hotel to start their investigation, but are unsuccessful in trying to talk their way in past a periphery guard. The guard tells them to come back in an hour after their investigation is over, and they scamper off behind a building to try a fire escape where, on the sixth floor, they see part of the building blown out, glass shattered everywhere. They encounter a down-on-his-luck witness behind the building named Terry Bode, who was there with his friends the night before, Skitty and Enon. It seems Enon was actually taken as well, and they confirm that Onet, the chamberwoman, was also taken by the weird creature. Terry's hiding something under his arms that we never quite get a good look at, but while Augie talks and comforts him, Howard searches the area and ends up taking a bleed as he encounters a weird fleshy boiled bacon-like substance that moves. And the doctor, who should be smart, decides to pick it up, but with three sixes, Charlie is able to expertly use her blade to cut it free and place it in a bleed container before it can embed within his arm. Terry recommends they go talk to his friend Skitty at the Good Gravy Eatery, by the way, I love the name, and finds the red-haired veteran trying to recover. The trio were high that night when Enon was taken, so he isn't quite sure what he saw, the circle able to say it was maybe a loose animal from the zoo, and comfort the man with some free food as he ruminates over his friend's left-behind guitar. After talking with him, they return to the hotel and see no guard waiting at the door, and head upstairs where there's sadly another one in place. Arlo is able to use her good looks and fake a fainting spell, and the guard hurries off to fetch her some water while they sneak in. The crime scene is a wreck and reeks of bleed residue, but they're stopped by the captain of the guard, standing in the room with a witness, wondering what they're doing there. The doctor decides, let's punch him in the face, and he is knocked unconscious. Augie steals his badge while they question the witness, Kara Bellman, who's Onet's assistant, and has been keeping Onet's affair with a horn player named Wayland Freed on the down low. Interesting how a second instrument has come into play. However, they freak her out and she rushes off and the other guard comes into the room, which somehow they also are able to play off by pretending they were helping Arlo. Poor dude just wanted to help the pretty lady. On the way out, they pass OUP members, one of them being the one that questioned Augie after his incident. As they start heading to a restaurant where Wayland was set to perform, they notice they're being tailed by an OUP member, definitely having been marked because of Augie. Though they fail many times to lose him, he ends up following Charlie, being the one with a reputation and the one he recognizes, to a church where she hides in the confessional. She asks a man of the cloth for help, and he is able to secure her an exit through his office, with a donation. And once she's escaped, the circle regroup at the venue but learn it's been cancelled already by Kara, who's actually in the trio with the man who's missing. Interesting she withheld that information. 
Seeking to find her whereabouts, they go to speak with Aaron Ferris, Onet's husband, who Arlo actually knows through family connection. It seems the man already knows she's missing and is also having a hard time because she's missing with somebody, and they begin a line of questioning about any unusual activity in the past few days. All he recounts is for their anniversary they went shopping, and he surprised her with, guess what, the emerald necklace from the prologue, made from a stone procured by a woman named Dorna Ashfur, who works at the Alizarin gallery that was mentioned in the last episode. They also notice he has a bandage on his hand, and with some convincing, he takes off the wrapping and we find the weird bacon flesh thing embedding within him. Seems that Kara was his introduction to Dorna, and clearly the green necklace is a potential link. Leaving with Arlo's advice that he should cut his hand off, we learn more of her past. Arlo took a bleed while examining the man's hand, and she felt a strange hunger, and we learn where her own bleed scar came from. Arlo had a fiancé that was taken, Eddie, who was interested in relics. She came to see him one night while he was working, and found him being pulled through a portal. She tried to save him, her arm going through to reach for him, but when she pulled free of it, Eddie was gone, and her hand was withered. While well, before it was just a damaged appendage, a dark void now rests in her palm, it only having appeared after their last mission. She recounts that the creature that took her Eddie has also gray skin, which is interesting. Does that mean she's slowly transforming into one of these monsters? Maybe she's about to be bacon flesh? The heaviness is, however, cut by Augie asking if she's now single. You know, not for him. I love it. Ashley fits that character so well. She does, however, bring up Eddie's organization, the Red Hand, and Charlie knows some information about it. It's a faction of dealers of artifacts and scavenged and found things from long-forgotten past. It's kind of Candela Obscura's sus cousin. Deciding to go straight to the source, they head to the Alizarin Gallery, hosting an exhibit called Shadows of Memory. Charlie uses her status to get in with Dorna, who is wearing a red gown and red and black gloves and uses the guise of trying to buy something. But Arlo of the Black family is kicked out, and, I mean, followed by Augie for his rough appearance. But before they can even make a fight, suddenly Matt scares the shit out of the cast after two explosions, the set lights flickering. A many-armed and legged gray bulbous creature covered in brick and cloth breaks through a wall. The boys, taking a brain at the horror they see, begins to scamper away, now having Dorna as captive. It seems to be a weird fusion of a bunch of missing people. While Howard and Arlo chase after the beast, the other two stop to search Dorna's office. They find a small, snapped and locked briefcase and the black and red stitched gloves that belong to Dorna, and as Charlie grabs it, she gets a bleed as the bacon flesh embeds in her. We return to the other two, where the monster spreads the bodies and grows a mouth using the lovers Onet and Waylon's forms. They were kind of fused together. Dying via coitus isn't a bad way to go, though, if I'm being honest. Howard takes a brain at the site and snaps, his fourth brain that will be a scar if he survives the night. The beast begins to escape through the sewer, and Charlie opens the case, finding some strange obsidian shards within, and uses the gloves to handle them, throwing them at the beast which it doesn't like. However, it still manages to get down the manhole. Using the bleed she took earlier, Arlo channels that the monster is very scared. Howard awakes and almost lobotomizes himself and removes a piece of his skull to expand his mind, his scar forcing him to take a point from focus and move it to sense. Deciding that no one else can probably stop it, they follow the monster down and reckon if they damage the emerald, it might stop him. Augie reveals that he stole the periphery captain's gun as well as his badge, and Arlo uses her occult book to find an old fairy myth that talks about a similar beast. It talks about a shard of Graydon, used to punish the most heinous individuals, binding them to a demon of endless hunger. No worse crime than wanting to devour and be imprisoned to an endless appetite. They use a bleed detector to track it down the sewers, and they find Dorna screaming, claiming she's only a dealer for Lycus, whoever that is, and Augie uses music by singing Happy Birthday to get its attention. It pounces after them, and Charlotte takes her fourth body and passes out. Augie tries to shoot the emerald, and it shatters, but it grabs a hold of him in his mouth. 
Arlo uses a forbidden ritual to create pillars, spelling out runes on the ground and touching it with her withered hand. They pinch and hold the monster in place, the body beginning to fall apart as the enchantment is broken. Onette utters to her lover that she's sorry, until all the bodies melt away. So I think we can also assume that Enon is gone as well. But Dorna is never confirmed. Augie helps Charlie, and a weak Arlo is led up by Howard to the street. Arlo takes a bleed scar, the gray moving up her entire arm and to her neck because of the ritual. A point moves from sway to sense. Charlie's scar is that she can no longer move her hand correctly and loses a point and move to survey. After returning to the Gilded Rainbow, they realize the gloves that were Dorna's are actually from the Red Hand, meaning they might have something to do with all the artifacts. There's a lot to cover in these tiny murder mystery stories, so I apologize if I missed any details. Apparently, there's only one game left, by the way. It seems the quartet will retire, however, Matt says there's a chance they'll come back at some point. The epilogue features Augie showing up to take a bath at Arlo's, and she takes him shopping for a new suit. Charlie goes to visit Gertrude, her mother at the Danbury estate, who took Charlie in and was a previous Candela member, and she begins studying more now that she has a handicap. Howard goes home and smokes some Scarlet Shake, though behind him he presses a switch that summons a blue smoke face named Dean, and Howard utters, let's find Arlo's bone, before the smoke enters the new hole in his head. I guess he's a villain now, maybe. What an ending. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my recaps of Campaign 3 of Critical Role on my channel. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe out there. But date my friends.